friends looking for full-time and part-time positions. So if you are interested, please send me your resume to this email right here. Also, uh, Dr. Small will your resume before you send it as well as offering to and that stuff is a good idea of a rigorous market. So definitely set that up. Also, there is an OSSC meeting tomorrow. Hot Society is in California. I will be there. No, I won't be there. I can't make it. Oh, okay, we'll be there. But still, I I'm here. You go to them. Uh, it's a great way to network and to learn about their engineers and scientists in the industry. And also, you can you know, also get a job. I also like to share through the OSSC. So I highly recommend you invest your time in the order. Okay, so we're just going to go ahead and get started now. So, oh, yes, and also. Yep. And for that this part, this Friday, we have Blue Ball at 9 o'clock. All right. well, th thank you very much. And um, what I want to do, I'm just going to jump right into it and you'll learn a little bit about myself, about me, uh, during the course of this talk. But um, I've, I've given something like this uh, several times at different universities, always tend to change it up quite a bit, but I do like the title, Light at the End of the Tunnel. And of course, right, is it a train, right? No, it's actually your career, right? So the tunnel is your educational process, and in this case here at Cal Poly Pomona. And there are many, many, many careers in optics and photonics, and we're gonna talk about that uh, as we go forward. But one of the things I wanna do during this presentation, especially in the beginning, is kind of give you a little bit of my history because something like 35 years ago, I was where you are now. I was a student at the University of Arizona, and uh, you can see uh, I was actually in the physics department, but I was in the College of Engineering. The College of Optical Sciences was the Optical Sciences Center. Uh, one of my professors thought that I was doing well, and he said I should be in the honors program, which is now the honors college. And so I ended up graduating with honors in physics, and the, um, oh, Somehow I didn't get the optical levitation part on here. So I'm going to tell you about my honors project in physics called optical levitation. Uh, that was on the flyer. And um, I've been a member of OSA uh, since I was in college and uh, the OSSC for about oh, 25 years or so. Started the Optics Institute of Southern California in 2003, about 15 years ago, in order to do educational outreach. Um, I've been uh, on the board of uh, advisors for Irvine Valley College oh, for probably over 25 years or maybe 30 years or something like that. And I started the uh, optical engineering and instrument design programs at UC Irvine about nine, almost 10 years ago. Uh, been a member of SPIE for all my adult life and uh, started this optobotics. That's just a word for um, and some programs that I did for optics and robotics because shouldn't your robots have eyes, right? So I'm not gonna talk about many of these things, uh, nor the eLase America, that's laser education kits. Uh, but I will, you know, if you see, get an email from me or all these uh, links or hot links to these various programs. And the reason why I'm telling you these things, th I pulled out this uh, little article, a one page article here from the UC Irvine Continuing Education Magazine, talking about career zot, Zod, of course, is the sound that the anteater makes, which is the mascot for UC Irvine. It says, you are your own brand, right? So as you're listening to this presentation and thinking about your career, think about you as a brand. You, the only thing you really have in this life is your reputation. Each of us is an individual kind of trapped in our body, and that's just how it is. And so what, how you interact with people on a regular basis, you leave that impression with them as long as they're going to remember it, right? So like now I'm recording this because I've worked on my brand for many years and now I'm to the point where, you know, if something happens to me in life, if there's anything that I can add of value to your lives and the lives of other people, 
I want to try and do that. So uh, I work uh, full time for Starrett. That's why I have this shirt. And you'll hear a, a bit about Starrett in just a moment, just a little bit, not much. Let's see if I can get this thing to work. Oh no. Come on. Hmm. Well, there we go. So uh, what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to talk about critical thinking a little bit. And I want, you know, you're in physics for the most part, optics. So you have to think critically. I would love you to consider thinking critically about every other aspect of your life as well. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But today I'm going to talk about mentors and I'll give you a, a little more introduction to myself, the employment outlook in optics and photonics different areas that I think are going to be growing in optics and photonics. And right now it's everything. Uh, we'll have some discussion where I'll tell you a little bit about important ideas and personality traits and things that you might consider as your career. And then I'll talk a little bit about optical levitation uh, at the end. So this particular uh, wood cutting, uh, anybody know what that is? You can go ahead and just, uh, anybody seen this before? It was in an astronomy book. Uh, this is a man uh, in medieval times, it's a medieval woodcut, and he's putting his head through the sphere of the stars to see what's behind the stars, right? Of course, the, this, the earth is flat, there's the sun, there's the moon, and he wanted to find out about the stars, right? So how did humans in history get to be where we are today? Curiosity, right? Trying to figure out well, how does the universe work? So physics is a great uh, field to study to learn about that. So critical thinking, clearly in optics and photonics, we think about the question, what is light, right? So we'll address that kind of more at the end in optical levitation, but these are really rhetorical questions. So we're not gonna get into it too much, but I love to put this question out. It's my favorite question uh, to ask young people of all ages, old people, anybody, to just think, what is light? Now, because we're talking about careers, what is money? People don't necessarily think about what is money, right? And now we have things like Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and there's a whole lot of interesting things. And have you ever heard of the term quants? Quants are people that have studied quantum mechanics and have gone into the financial industry, right? And they're quantitative analysis or analysts, right? So they're dealing with money. So having a degree in math and physics can definitely help you financially. My, my son went to uh, Columbia University and studied applied math and many of his colleagues, when he was your age, went into the financial industry and work on Wall Street because they used their mathematic ability to deal with money. So again, not gonna talk a lot about money during this presentation, but I want you to take away thinking about well, what does money mean to you? It's, you're gonna do something or sell something and someone's gonna give you money, right? So it's, it's this transaction thing. Now this is, you think those two things are a little bit different for a talk like this. The last one here on this page is love. What is love, right? So light, money, and love. They're very abstract concepts, right? But yet we all experience them hopefully daily, right? Even, and, and love doesn't, isn't necessarily, <laughs> love is not necessarily something that's just between a man and a woman. It's parents and children and grandparents and extended family and even, you know, your colleagues and, you know, the, the when you're there for somebody, right? So it's an expression, it's a feeling, it's something that, you know, you're gonna be there for other people. That's kind of what love is about. And that is actually where I wanna start right now. So mentors, I've been very fortunate in my life to have many mentors. I, uh, the first three on the top left there, I started out, uh, Frank Memmer, he was my high school astronomy teacher. And that's where I first saw that woodcut that I showed you a few minutes ago. And he got me on this journey. I didn't know what I was gonna do. I was good in math. I took astronomy and I was bitten, smitten. You know, I fell in love with astronomy. I fell in love with black holes and quasars and you know, the ultimate questions and all that. Uh, Professor Shea and Bickle were both at the University of Arizona and uh, they were physics professors and they both encouraged me and kept me going. They were, one of them was a pres uh, the faculty member for the Society of Physics Students. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. Professor Shea, I taught introductory physics lab when I was a junior and senior in college. And he's the one that said I should be in the honors program. And I said to him, but isn't that just for students that get straight A's and I'm studying physics and physics students don't typically get straight A's. And he said, don't worry about that. So when my mentors 
told me to do something, I just did it. I thought, you know, they knew what they're talking about. They're older than I am. And so fine. If your mentors, if you have a mentor and you trust that person, follow their direction. Uh, Bob Fisher, another mentor of mine, taught me optical design and optical uh, instruments and uh, Al Hathaway optomechanics. Um, I'm not sure if you can see that. I'm in the way there, but Al Hathaway, actually Al Hathaway just recently passed away. Bill Bicker passed away last summer. Frank Memmer a few years ago. Uh, and Bob Fisher is not well either. So what happens obviously is when your mentors get older, they are human and they go through these human things and that's where the love part comes in, okay? These people that are mentoring you, you know, they do it not because they have to, because they want to, because they see something in you that maybe they saw in themselves or maybe somebody saw in them. Uh, Brian Lula from uh, president of PIUSA, I worked for him for 10 years. I never worked for anybody that long. Uh, he was uh, SPIE uh, treasurer, secretary, an amazing mentor in technology and a uh, extremely advanced amateur astronomer. So it just you know hit home for me. Uh, Jim Trollinger hired me young in my career and I, he also hired me again a second time and he's on our advisory board for the UC Irvine program. Uh, Mark Aronall is a friend I worked for over 20 years ago and I'm working for him again and he's a Cal Poly alumni. So he said I should put that in there. And you can see he's not wearing a shirt or tie. He's actually a triathlete and he's very good. Uh, I'm a triathlete. We, you know, I'm not as good as he is because he has longer legs than I do. But uh, he's, he's an amazing man. And I just wanted to uh, recognize him. He you know, encourages me to do this sort of thing that I'm doing right now, and especially to Cal Poly. Now, this last uh, image here, my wife, my mother and father. OK, clearly that's the love part, right? But those are the people in your life that encourage you to do whatever it is you're going to do. So I can't tell you more about mentors or mentorships or apprenticeships and things like that. Now you're going to have to go out and experience that as part of your career. So this is an optical joke, right? So if you have a cylindrical tube, in this case, a um, test tube full of water, and you put it over some uh, red and blue letters, some of them go upside down and some of them do not. So that's fun. And the, uh, the other uh, diagram here, you probably all recognize that, that's Snell's law, right, at a uh, refraction at a curved surface. So that's where optics kinds of really starts, unless you just have a plane surface, right? And you can see that um, while it looks relatively straightforward, as soon as you start having optics and rays, you have trigonometry and algebra. So you can't do trigonometry, you can't do optics without math. And, uh, and we like that, right? So the Society of Physics students at the University of Arizona in the 1980s, I was fortunate to be the president of that chapter. And uh, we did physics days and we had tours, tours of the Optical Sciences Center, the physics of music, there was physics for nurses. We had all kinds of fun things. And I had uh, uh, somebody help me print these up and post the flyers all over to get students to come to the talks just like you guys came to this talk today. So again, I wanna let you know that 35 years ago, I was where you are now. And in 35 years, you may be standing up in front of a group telling people about what you did in your career. And I'm sure you all are gonna have good careers because you're here today. And just being here today is just really good steps forward in that direction. You can go on the website at OSSC or get on my links and you can read about my particular background and my history and things. So I made a telescope when I was in high school. I made an eight inch F8 Newtonian telescope and making an optical instrument like that. I mean, it just continues on. And so fast forward, you know, the last oh, five years or so, I've been able to work on the 30 meter telescope, the Giant Magellan telescope, uh, many other telescope projects, usually doing precision positioning of optical instruments, right? So that was very fun and um, many other things that uh, you can see on, on this particular slide. And then again, remember your, your name, you're your own brand, right? So this is me, right? And, and then this is also me. This is my website I've created. And, you know, maybe there aren't a whole lot of other friends that I have that do this sort of thing because I'm a little bit more nutsy about it because that's all I do, right? I have my job, I have my family and I do this and I, train and, you know, kind of do triathlon stuff. And that's pretty much it. That's my life. Other people have a lot of other things they like to do. And that's great. You know, you do whatever really 
you know, makes you happy. That's what you got to do. So if you go on this website, you can see the uh, opticsage.com uh, uh, website and you can find out more about me and more about the different companies and the different activities that I do. So right back into the uh, employment outlook for you. So I talk about optical engineering and optics and photonics, uh, very fast growing, many, many industries. Typically you need a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, um, but you know, you can get a master's degree later. You don't have to like go right from your bachelor's to your master's. You can go get a job, do an internship, get a master's later. I actually got a master's in technology management because I found that back in the day when I was doing optics, uh, my managers didn't know optics. So optics was a part of what we were doing and they hired me because I knew about optics, but they didn't know what they were doing. And so I decided, well, I should go and get a management degree, but I didn't want an MBA because I didn't want to be like a bean counter or something. And I found a program called technology management at Pepperdine University. So I got that. And, um, and then I've just been doing optics and management on and off all my life, which is fun. So again, uh, math and physics, you have to have that. You got to have problem solving techniques, uh, equipment, you know, it's very, I mean, you could be a theoretical physicist or an engineer. Uh, that's not me. You know, I always like to have hands on, uh, at this point in my career, some of the younger people that I work with think I just do theoretical stuff because they're doing all the hands-on stuff. I've done the hands-on stuff for many, many years. And I can tell you stories about going into the lab or the production of the prototype areas and showing the technicians and other people, yes, this is how you have to align the fiber optic to the waveguide. And because I've done that many times, they're like, well, you don't know how to do that because it's hard, right? Have you, anybody ever aligned a fiber optic to a waveguide? No, you got to try that sometime, okay? Because the diameter of a fiber optic core is like 10 microns, and sometimes they're even smaller, right? If they're tapered and things. So waveguides and fiber optics and alignment, uh, photonics. I'll talk a little bit about photonics in a little bit. So anyway, the job outlook, um, obviously very good in optics and photonics because there just are not enough people like you who are studying that in college. It is a little bit hard, right? It's harder than many other... Um, tracks or fields you might study in college. So therefore, how many people know someone that was in physics or something and then went to a different discipline? Yeah. So what's the uh, salary, salary outlook? How about that, right? The average salary is uh, 85 to $97,000. That's pretty good, right? Now, that's not for starters. For starters, you know, uh, might be probably closer to 60,000, right? How's 60,000 sound for your first job, right? 50, 60, is that good? Okay. So <laughs> I'll show you in another slide or two, you know, th there are salary surveys, SPIE does a salary survey and there's many others out there. So you can actually see what the current job openings are. And then as soon as you start interviewing uh, and asking them, you know, what are the salary ranges, then you'll get real. I think it's very real because then when they give you an offer, right? Then the numbers are there and then they'll actually pay you. If you get a job, they'll pay, you'll get your first paycheck and you'll be like, it's real, right? So that goes back to what is money, right? What does money mean to you, right? And how do you use money? So I would encourage all of you to learn a little bit more about money and personal finances, okay? Because that's really important because when you get a job, what are you going to do with the money you got? So, uh, Jobs, jobs, jobs. So uh, one of the things that I like a lot is uh, drones, drones and robots, right? Anybody like drones? Drones are big in optics, right? Because surveillance, intelligence, chemical reactions, right? You can see chemical reactions with optics. It could be a robot that's looking at some chemical reaction so that the human doesn't have to actually be there and get in the way. Fire damage, right? Everybody heard about all the fires, right? So they can actually use not just video, but they can actually use whether it's infrared or different types of imaging systems to determine where there are hot spots and where there are not, you know, and even if it's like smoldering, is it really out? So optics plays a big role in fire, uh, firefighting, agriculture, all kinds of border security, harbor security, looking at uh, the uh, populations, natural resources, wildlife management, all these different disciplines 
that you as a physics person, you may have an interest in, maybe it's a hobby or something, right? Maybe you can marry your hobby to your physics, right? And optics. So that's what I like to encourage. And that's why a slide like this is important because there are all these other types of things you can do if you know about optics, right? Maybe you want to design a better optical system for some specific type of uh, imaging capability or sensing capability. So the areas that are expected to grow, and this is not a full list, but this is just kind of what we have in the slide here, uh, optical instruments and medical, right? Huge medical, UC Irvine, the Beckman Laser Institute and Medical Clinic, uh, they have a lot of medical uh, instrument uh, development going on there and that's gonna be growing. Uh, clean energy, entertainment, of course, right? I mean, even the webcam here and your phone, uh, as well as other types of imaging projectors for entertainment, as well as cameras, right? Well, like 3D kind of things and stereo types of things for uh, entertainment, right? And your cell phone, all kinds of optics involved in entertainment. Of course, cancer research, uh, nuclear fusion and fission, photolithography, making semiconductors, right? These all of, these, all of these are close by in Southern California or Northern California. Um, one of the key things in many of these industries like aerospace and optics and aerospace is that the workforce is retiring. And so, and there are new technologies coming on board. So the people that may be my age, you know, we may not know the latest technology, right? Like I mentioned fiber optics and silicon photonics and stuff, right? So people in your, in your uh, stage in your careers, you can learn these things and then it can become part of your career. So whatever it is that's of great interest for you, that's where you wanna go. So Southern California, again, has a whole host with like a microcosm of the world, right? Optometry, astronomy, medical lasers, optical design and manufacturing. There are companies that are hiring people in all these industries right now, or at least pretty much most of them. Telecommunications, of course, fundamental physics and optics, big science projects, Caltech, LIGO, all around Southern California, the big telescope programs. There are people, you know, there are jobs available at the 30 meter telescope, the giant Magellan telescope. They're always right now, especially because a lot of good things are happening in the economy. And, and you may remember, or you may not remember, but if you look in history, the economy has been up and down over the course of my life, many different times. So right now the economy is good. And so there are good jobs out there and so you guys are really, um, how many of you are getting ready to graduate in 2019? A few of you, okay. So, and then I, my guess is for the next few years or five years, maybe more, the economy should continue to grow. And that's worldwide. So you guys don't have to just stay and uh, look for jobs in the US, Canada, Mexico, Europe, Asia, Latin America, all kinds of jobs all over the world. It can be very exciting. My son got a job in Germany right out of college. Right? So he's still in Germany and he loves it. He travels around Europe. So there, you know, especially if you can speak a different language besides English, that can be very helpful. So the Optical Society of Southern California, if you go on their website and look up the corporate members, uh, many of these companies hire right out of the Optical Society of Southern California. So what Anthony said during every, every meeting they have there, they ask who's new, who's looking for a job and who's hiring. People have gotten jobs at the meetings of the Optical Society of Southern California. Businesses like supply chain optics grew out of the Optical Society of Southern California, and it continues to grow. And yeah, yeah, it's great, you know. So, you know, there are really good job opportunities in networking, like at the like at this event here and the Optical Society of Southern California, right here. Go meet people, put yourself out there, you know, get your brand, you know, figure out who you are, and, and you don't have to do it right now, of course, but understand what your capabilities are, what you're passionate about. Why do you study physics and optics? Because that's hard. Aim photonics. So about, I'm gonna say five years ago, that might not be the right time, but the previous uh, federal government administration uh, put this in place. There were probably half a dozen or more institutes for manufacturing of different things. The photonics was the best funded and is probably the most successful. Yes, I'm a little biased, but I think if you're a researcher, you'll find out that it is true. And I, even when this was going on, I was part of it kind of trying to help guide UC Irvine and some others and doing whatever I could, mostly in the education side. But, um, you know, the, the phases of a project, right? You know, enthusiasm, and then it drops off and goes back up. And I thought, I thought they were going to crash and burn. Uh, and they, they almost did. 
like many other government programs or government funded programs, but they've actually uh, come back and they're doing much better now and they're hiring more people, both uh, in uh, kind of upstate New York is where a lot of it is, uh, but also on the West Coast at uh, UC Santa Barbara. So uh, again, you can go on the websites here, aim at ucsb.edu and find out more about it. Again, education and workforce, you know, that's a key component of any of these government programs is that they are responsible. When the government gives money to these programs, they have to help educate the workforce. So silicon photonics, again, putting light from a, maybe a tapered fiber optic into a silicon photonic waveguide, very fun, very exciting, very challenging if you don't have just the right tools. But when you finally get the light in and you get your, you know, you design your waveguide to do whatever function it's supposed to do, uh, check it out. It's pretty fun. It, uh, you know, with your background, physics, optics, um, math, engineering, maybe a little bit, uh, silicon photonics, I think, is a very exciting uh, uh, place to be. Back in about 18 years ago, in, two, in the year 2000, it was a big telecom boom, and then it was a bust because they didn't do it right. Now they're going to do it right. Uh, I can explain a little bit more about that another time, or if you have questions about silicon photonics and this AIM photonics program, uh, I find it very exciting and um, think they're going to do well. The company I used to work for, PI, the Zeke Instrument, that we have some um, very nice automated alignment tools for doing just what I described, getting light in and out of silicon photonic waveguides. And of course, they have an academy, right? What would it be without an academy, right? So this website is kind of all focused on how do they do education? What's the roadmap? What's the opportunities in the industry? Uh, and again, jobs, right? Job postings right here, right? So a lot of places for you guys to look for jobs and really fun and exciting careers to, to get into. So discussion part, this is good because I'm making good time. And what I want to be able to do is, you know, maybe have some little back and forth with you guys. But um, what do I consider to be important in your background and your education and your personality traits, right? In order to do something in optics and photonics. And so I have my notes here. You'll excuse me while I look at my notes because when I've, I've done this, you can see, uh, oh, you can't see my notes here. I've done this at, for UC Irvine for the optical engineering program as part of a panel discussion. And you can go online to the UC Irvine program. And th typically there's somewhere where you can click on a link and it'll bring up probably something like, might be an hour presentation. and what I'm about to tell you is kind of from that, okay? So it's important to have some background with hands-on engineering, physical sciences, technical work experience with optics, right? So in addition to your education that you're getting here, if you have, you know, like I, I made a telescope in my spare time. If you're doing anything in your spare time, being part of this club includes, that, that's a good place to start. Uh, formal education, of course. The personality traits uh, tend to be successful is being very analytical and very methodical, okay? If you're a little bit scattered, you know, that's not gonna be quite as good. Um, solving puzzles, how many people like to solve puzzles? You guys like to solve puzzles? When I was a kid, I used to make puzzles. I used to like make mazes and my friends and I, we'd like go back and forth and we'd do each other's mazes. Um, I like doing the theoretical, but then I'm not happy just doing the theoretical. I wanna do the theory and then I wanna go and make it if I can, right? So taking the theory and taking the practical and putting it together and see how well you did. Now, if I get to the end of the optical levitation, uh, you'll see that. And really important to find global solutions. Okay, I was talking to a few of these guys, the, the guys here earlier about global solutions versus local solutions. And I'll use uh, ZMAX as the optical design software tool. In that, if, if, if you're just learning how to use a software tool, you want to be able to think kind of outside the box. If you're just changing the radius of curvature or a lens thickness or maybe some spacing between a couple of lenses or something and trying to get the optimum imaging, that might, not, that might just be what we call a local solution. You may have to change a lens altogether or add another lens or maybe make a diffractive optical element or an A-sphere or change something. You're not gonna, the software is not going to help you figure out how to do that. Right? You have to be able to have some education where your professors have really got you to think clearly in, in, a, in an artful way, okay, in a creative way. So 
science, you know, it's, it's not just facts and numbers and you follow the formulas and you get the answer. There's an art to science. As a matter of fact, there's a book called The Art of Scientific Investigation. So think about uh, being artistic and creative in using your science and your optics and photonics. Um, being able to work as an individual contributor as well as a team player. Okay, so a lot of times you'll just have to do your homework on your own, do your project on your own. Maybe you're going to be the only optics person in a group, but then you have to be able to take that and merge it and integrate it with the rest of the solution and the rest of the team members. So you got to work together as a team member and also be able to work on your own. Uh, be well organized in what you're doing. Okay, if you can't write legibly, it's going to be very hard to remember what it was that you did. Right, I've gotten homeworks from people I can't read it. If I can't read it, they, they don't pass, right? If some uh, employee of mine or a staff member gave me a report that I couldn't read, then what good is it? He wasted his time or her time, right? Um, be passionate, have confidence, have drive, and be innovative. Those are the types of things that are gonna lead to your success. So uh, the growth in optics and photonics, and specifically different types of opportunities for you, Again, uh, locally here, I've mentioned some of those, like, uh, for example, Illumina. Illumina is a company that is, makes the world's leading uh, genetic um, DNA sequencing systems. And I think we're going to have a talk by one of the principal optical engineers at an OSSC meeting, I think, in January. I forgot. It's Simon, Simon uh, he gave a talk out in Ventura, and we're going to have him uh, here in Southern California. I think it's going to be in... Um, in or South Orange County. So uh, anyway, there's so many different growth opportunities here. Like I said, telescopes, big science, um, semiconductor photolithography, aerospace. Aerospace and defense is coming back to Southern California, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, Boeing. Uh, the big companies are gonna be hiring optics again. Uh, the entertainment industry. Uh, there's a company uh, not far from uh, in Lake Forest called Red. Red Digital and also, um, uh, what's the panorama? Panasonic. Panas not Panasonic, no, the, the, com the company that makes the cameras. Um, panorama, I wanna say Panorama. Panavision, that's it, yeah. So Panavision out in the valley, uh, you know, they're making really high-end cameras for entertainment. You know, obviously medical imaging. So in order for you to find where these jobs are, in addition to, like I mentioned, the AIM Photonics and the Optical Society of Southern California, uh, AIP, that's the American Institute of Physics, uh, Work in Optics, SPIE, uh, Photonics Jobs, and, and there's more out there as well. And there are recruiters, okay? I get constant contact from recruiters. You know, they're asking me, you know, do I know somebody that can do this or that, or here's a list of openings they have all across the country. You know, and they're looking for laser people, optics people. Many times they're looking for uh, people that have a few years of experience, which is why, you know, uh, if you're not like set on going and getting your master's and PhD right away, I would encourage you to get a job. And then sometimes the company you work for may help pay for your master's degree or something, but get some experience under your belt working in the uh, in industry. And, and that way, when the recruiters are looking for people with a few years of experience, then you'll have that because you're all, I think you're all younger than I am. That's for sure. Right. So, um, and here's one, uh, I think this is tomorrow, right? Tomorrow strategies for securing an industry interview. So this is for you. I got this from OSA and, um, you can, uh, and if you go to the OSSC website, there's an image like this and a link for you to register for this. It's a webinar, right? It's, uh, 12.30 Eastern time, so 12.30 Eastern time is um, 9.30 California time, right? So if you have an opportunity, and it's probably going to be recorded, so if you're busy, register for it, and then you can get the recording and see what they have to say. Because things like this, I don't see these types of things coming up that often. And so this person, um, John uh, from uh, McKinsey & Company, McKinsey & Company is a consulting agency, right? So they, they've been around for decades. And so they, they get involved in all kinds of industries and they're always looking for 
ways to help. And I think what's happening is that the consulting industry is seeing that the big companies like Intel and IBM and Google and Facebook and Amazon, all these companies, they're all going after optics for multiple reasons. The reasons why those big companies are going after optics is for drones and surveillance and automotive, um, like driverless cars. They all want to get into driverless cars, optics, optics, LIDAR, you know, imaging, and telecommunications and silicon photonics because they all have huge server farms, right? And the bottleneck on the internet, the reason the internet is slow is because the photons going through the fiber optics that are all over the world slow down when they get to the servers because they have to change into electrons. So that's what the AIM photonics is all about. It's all about changing the inside of your computer, inside of the server, and make the photons go farther into the processing, okay? So maybe, maybe they'll talk about that. So uh, advice for um, people entering optics and photonics, know yourself, okay? Look in the mirror, know who that person is, know who, what that person's strengths are, what your weaknesses are, what you're passionate about, what you wanna learn about, uh, what experiences you have, and what experiences you wanna get. And also what kind of a person or people do you wanna find as your mentors? Remember in the beginning, look for mentors, look for people that might hire you or that you might be able to work with that can be your mentors, okay? Because those are the people that you're gonna learn from and they'll help you. Understand the business goals and the strategies of the organization you're being a part of, right? So you might go in and you might be, you know, if you go to work for Google, right? Maybe you'll just be in one particular small group, but understand the bigger picture or Northrop Grumman or a university or a Symer. You know, whatever company it is that you're gonna go and work for, understand your role, but try and learn as much as you can about the company and find out what your role in your team and your department, what are they supposed to be doing for the overall company? One of the most important things that we stress in the optical engineering programs and anytime I'm speaking to people is parameters, design parameters, specifications, and tolerances, okay? It's most important to understand your tolerances because if there are no tolerances, then you can make anything. But if you have to make something and it has to be within the tolerances required, then you have to learn how to measure it. So in ZMAX and SolidWorks and many other software programs, they have tolerances and you need to use them. You need to pay attention to the tolerances of whatever physics and optics and mechanics and electronics you're dealing with so that whatever it is you're making will be easily assembled and will work effectively. I've said before, optical engineering, optics and photonics, it's half art and half science, half engineering, right? So there's, there's a flavor, there's the human element. That's what you bring to the puzzle. If, if it was just straight facts, then they wouldn't need humans, right? They'd just plug everything into a computer. So it can't be that, right? It's, it's how your neural network understands the surroundings and your company and the projects you're on and how you're gonna integrate what you know, what you're bringing to the table. And um, people, the people in this room, your outside network, your family, your friends, the people that you'll meet, those are the people that are most important to you, right? They're gonna help you. Maybe, hopefully. So get networked. And that's what you're doing here. LinkedIn, how many people are on LinkedIn? A few. So a friend of mine, a good friend of mine told me some years ago, I should get on LinkedIn because I'm like good at networking. And I'm like, I don't want to be on that social media stuff. You know, I hate Facebook and all that stuff. I got on LinkedIn, love LinkedIn. Okay, LinkedIn is a professional uh, social network. So I would encourage you to get on LinkedIn and keep up your LinkedIn profile. You can see mine. Um, get on a distribution list of magazines of interest for you. Don't get on too many because you won't be able to have time to read them. Just get on the ones that you want to be on and, and pay attention to those uh, because now, you, now you're in an exploratory area, right? You're exploring life. You're going to find out what's going on. So keep it limited. Don't get too much information overload is way too prevalent, right? So try not to get information overload. Try and be selective about what you're getting and reinvent yourself from where you are today to where you're going to be in five years from now. Think about where you want to be in five years, right? Or 10 or whatever number is good for you. You know, maybe where you want to be next year or when you graduate, but think about it, look in the mirror 
Do you guys know the person in the mirror? Get to know that person because you have to live with that person for the rest of your life. You kind of don't get to change that. And uh, really, in my opinion, the sky is the limit. Actually, the sky is not the limit. Way beyond the sky for optics and photonics. So I really think that uh, you'll have fun with that. So let me just run through this real quick. Um, I have a copy of this here and you can download my paper. But when I was your age or maybe a little bit younger, this guy, Art Ashkin, who just won the Nobel Prize in Physics, he came to my school, he gave a talk. It was so simple. He kind of had like some drawings like this and he said, yeah, you can levitate small particles in a laser beam. And I'm like, that is so cool. I can do that. And I went to my professor and I said, I want to do that experiment. And he said to me, great, Don, first you should, from a theoretical perspective, derive the fundamental equations that he's using in order to levitate a small particle. And I said, oh, great, because he never did that. Art Ashkin never publishes how he derived his radiation pressure equations in any of his papers, because I got all his papers, read through all his papers. It's like, he doesn't tell you how to do it. So my brain, I had to do it, right? So I did it, and I did it in this paper. Uh, this was the setup that I had in the basement of the College of Optical Sciences with an argon laser beam that I snatched a mirror. This was a little flippo mirror. So when he wasn't doing his experiment over here, I had a little table over here. I had a, a big metal desk with an inner tube and a big piece of steel, square piece of steel, and then magnetic mounts, and everything was hooked on magnetic mounts on this. And uh, anybody heard of the Millikan oil drop experiment? Yeah, so I had done that, and I literally did the Millikan oil drop experiment on its side with a focused laser beam going up through the center. So I had to do all the uh, spheres. Remember in the beginning, I talked about Snell's law at a curved surface? That's all it is. Snell's law at a curved surface, right? And, but then we had to do momentum. And so these are the equations that I finally ended up having to figure out how to do it. And it's just geometry. And this, this little integral was a little bit tricky to figure out how to do it. The, the real key was trying to figure out how to manipulate the algebraic equation that I then had to integrate. But after several months of and many, many pages and cross it out and tear it up, and that, that was a dead end, I finally figured it out and it all worked and you can read it in the paper. The bottom line was there was the velocity of the oil drop that I was measuring. The experimental was here and, and I have all the different um, variables and it matched the theory. And that is what floats my boat. That's what turned me on to really like all my life, all I want to do is do cool theories and then show that the theory actually works and build it, right? So even today, if my company stare it, I can show an optical design because sometimes we like to do new designs for optical imaging for metrology. And I can show them that, look, if you put a flat mirror in the middle of your imaging system, if your mirror is not flat enough, your images will get distorted. And we can um, the theoretically uh, determine that, sorry. And um, then we can do the physical experiment in our shop. And that's pretty fun. That was one of the first things I did a couple years ago. So in this paper, here's all the data, or at least a sampling of the data that I took. And um, again, the bottom line was I had about 20 some, per 20 some percent error. Uh, in the theory and the experiment, but I did all the error analysis. How many people do error analysis in your class? Do they, uh, they make you do error analysis? Okay, so really key, always do the error analysis, okay? And, um, and that's the, for the optical levitation. I wanna have a few minutes to let you guys ask questions because I know we gotta get out of here right at one o'clock. So again, remember I asked what is light? Uh, quick facts about the sun. You guys all know how far away the sun is. Uh, I did this, uh, I did an exhibit about the speed of light in October of 2004 at Irvine Civic Center. And um, I had a little brochure about star children and star people, right? Because we're kind of like, we're made out of stardust, right? And uh, I like to think about when will we make the jump to hyperspace, right? Because science fiction and science fact, right? When science fiction leads to science fact, because you all know, according to physics that we know basically, we can't get to the nearest star system. Forget about the nearest star system that might have life, right? 
we can't get there yet in a human lifetime, right? But according to Star Wars and Star Wars and fiction, we can do it, right? So Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. I would like to encourage you guys to continue on your journey in optics and physics. And I wanna thank you and let you ask any questions you want. Anthony. Exactly. So that was really fun. Uh, interocular lenses, multifocal interocular lenses was the reason I was hired there. And diffractive interocular lens designs uh, have become prevalent. My mother actually has two diffractive interocular lens designed by a friend of mine. And um, I, I'll tell you the thing that really uh, our vice president of research and development once said to me, Don, there were a bunch of different multifocal interocular lens designs out there being tested and stuff. And he said, there is no way that they can all be equal or th th there has to be some that are better than others. And he was right, of course, there has to be, right? But the question is, what are the metrics? And the reality is that the human eye and the human mind, which is doing the image processing, is very forgiving for images because it's a very good image processor and it gets used to different types of images. So number one, multifocal interocular lenses work phenomenally well because most of the people that are getting them have very bad vision. So as soon as you put in a clear lens, even if it has multifocal points, uh, it's better than what they had before they had the uh, implant. And the problem can be that for myself, because I'm really particular about my vision, I wouldn't like a multifocal interocular lens. I actually made a, a physical mock-up where you could look through a telescope or binocular type thing that you could put different multifocal interocular lenses and they would relay the image into your eye and you could see the differences in the degradation of the image due to different lenses. And I could use multi, uh, mul uh, modulation transfer function, MTF, to analyze quantitatively the degradation of different images uh, performed by different um, lens designs. So what I said earlier about you know, using ZMAX, actually ZMAX couldn't even do any of that back then. I don't even know if ZMAX was around back then, but I actually learned from another mentor who had done, a, an, uh, he wrote his own optical design software to um, do diffractive optics or kinoforms, he called them at that time. Kinoforms was another word for diffractive optical elements sort of. So a uh, very interesting project, really amazing. Uh, I got two patents out of that and I, I had wanted to get some patents. Patents, you know, depending on yourself, some people really like to get a lot of patents. I have three and that's fine. What's that? Yeah, that's all right. You got, if any of you guys like that kind of work, you know, patents are fun. And, and um, that, that's a whole nother world of trying to navigate the art. Uh, there's a fellow at Raytheon, a, a contemporary of mine from the University of Arizona, a physics guy named Lacey Cook, and he's a member of the OSSC. And he's got probably over 60 patents, uh, works for uh, Raytheon in um, uh, A-sphere, um, we call it, um, you know, multi-mirror A-sphere optical designs for imaging, mostly in satellites and kinds of stuff. More questions? Pizza? Anybody want more pizza? Okay. Yeah, well, one more question. It depends on the intellectual property agreement you sign with your employer at the time of employment. Uh, I, I have one pat, so the IOLAB patents, they own them and I don't know what they did with them. I don't think they ever really pursued them. Uh, I did one of my own patents called the variable spacing diffraction grading because I like diffractive optics a lot. And uh, I actually patented that or I came up with that idea when I was in between jobs. I worked for Newport Corporation and I left there and before I joined Corning, uh, I patented uh, or I, I applied for a provisional patent application on that. And that ended up being mine. I wrote to both Newport and to Corning and I said, this is mine. This is not either of yours. And eventually I got some money for it. That was good. Anything else? Yeah, one more. I sold it. I sold it to a company that wanted to buy it. It was a patent portfolio company. They bought patents and, and there's actually somebody making uh, something based, well, they cite my patent. So a lot of times patents, you can get around the patent. So 
<laughs> Go figure that out, all right? All right, well, listen, you guys have been great. It's a real pleasure and an honor for me to be here tonight.